it is what it is. It's it's subjective, and that's that's something you do learn, and you have to remind yourself when you're doing film reviews. Is just be honest with yourself. You're not out to please people. If you don't like something, you don't like it. If you love it, then show your love for it. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Bartek Shemansky. I'm here with uh, the Across the Globe podcast. Uh, today, our special guests are Stephen John McLaughlin. Did I pronounce that correctly? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> McLaughlin. McLaughlin and, and John Walsh, um, and they are uh, both uh, founders um, of Movie Burner Entertainment, which we'll get into just shortly. Um, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the show. So I just want to start off, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess we, I, I could call you guys uh, film critics, uh, so to say. Um, and just wanted to ask you, you know, you guys have a lot of content uh, on, on your site. You guys have a lot of writers uh, and a lot of opinions uh, based on our industry. Uh, this is certainly a unique time uh, in both uh, Hollywood, um, in, indie projects uh, with the pandemic going on, uh, but also with big corporations and uh, just sort of the uh, back end dealing that's going on uh, and that has been going on even before the pandemic. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you first a uh, little bit about yourselves and uh, what got you guys to to, to start uh, Movie Burner. I'll let you go, Steve. You were the brain chain. Yeah. Um, back in 2016, um, it, it might have been earlier than that, actually. I think it was before Star Wars The Force Awakens came out. Yeah. We were watching a, a YouTube channel called Collider, and uh, they had this specific show on it called uh, Jedi Council. It was hosted by Christian Harloff and John Kempea, some big names in the sort of YouTube um, circles. And what we liked about what they were doing was that they, they were ordinary guys. You know, they weren't like um, what we've got over here, the Barry Normans or the Jonathan Rosses, uh, who were the sort of professional film critics, ordinary schmoes, as they like to call themselves. And it was something that really attracted us to this was, if you know, if these guys can do it and they're passionate about film and, and entertainment, um, there's nothing to stop us trying this, you know. But we, it was baby steps, wasn't it, John, for it us was, yeah. very early on? Before the YouTube channel started, before we were doing the podcast, we were doing writing. It was just myself, John, and my brother, Kevin. And that first year uh, in 2017, <laughs> we, were, we wrote about 365 film reviews one for every day, wow. and it almost killed us. It did. Yeah, um, it tested my love of film, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you. Because wow. it was that bad that we, we literally couldn't watch the other movies yeah. that the other guys were reviewing. So Stephen would watch, I don't know, some movie. Kevin would watch Moonlight. That's around about that time, yeah. the Moonlight uh, Lava Land thing sea, happened. Yeah. We, I couldn't watch it, so I've, I've still not seen Moonlight to yeah. this day. We, we really put ourselves the... <laughs> into a sort of position. We backed ourselves into a corner very early on, and setting our standards so high with the sort of um, uh, the people that were coming to the site. Mm -hmm. You know, they were expecting a review every day because that's what we set ourselves. So, okay, um, Guys, when, did you even get, uh, give yourselves a vacation policy? No, not at all. <laughs> we didn't. So, listen, being a lover of film like we are, I yeah. mean, it, it was enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I've probably watched less movies now uh, in yeah. an annual calendar than I have back then when we first started. And that's probably not... A great thing. I mean, when we were doing the, the written reviews, we were we were watching probably a hundred movies plus a year. Yeah. Now I probably watch a third of that, maybe a half, not maybe not a third, a half of that, and that's probably not a great thing. So in some ways, whilst it was torture, and it nearly did send me over the edge, nearly obviously having to write a, a review, literally watch the movie, but, have the review ready yeah. the next day. It was enjoyable as well because I was but, getting but to the watch website a whole, was a lot of the website movies. was getting good feedback. Uh, Bartek, it was really um picking up with the views and we felt um you know it's such a shame because we did have our eye on um doing podcasting at some point and we knew that we couldn't do both we couldn't spread ourselves that thin mm -hmm. um so that's when we came up with the idea was just putting an advert out and saying to people on social media is it, would anybody like to join the gang you know write some movie reviews for us we were very lucky in that sense you know that um i think it was four guys initially uh, who are no longer part of the team but they really uh, helped us buy some time to yeah. really look into how to you know do our own podcast how to present yeah. ourselves as well it was mm -hmm. it was it was really a learning curve um yeah. 
thankfully John's pulled a lot of those early podcasts off <laughs> um, our platforms because oh. they were very rough. Yeah. Um, I don't really want to get into the sort of meat and bones of how we produced those early it shows, but it was very it was. primitive at the time. You know, but, we just didn't know what we were doing. But you understand that yourself, um, having been doing the podcasting. When you do start right. and you're not used to podcasting, it can be as rough as hell. <laughs> just your manner, your tone, the energy you have to sort of exude. Yeah. And yeah. try to keep and, that up. You have to find that sort of balance. I want to ask you guys, because you, you guys did, did mention that, you know, you guys felt that you could not only offer opinions, but uh, something, you know, more professional, more of a cr uh, critique uh, on films that you were seeing. Uh, just for, um, you know, some of our listeners that may not be fully uh, endowed in, in what a film critic is, or uh, more importantly, who is qualified to, to be a film critic. So I guess in your own words, um, what makes a film critic and who gets to be a, a, a film critic? A very honest person that, <laughs> um, who won't shy away from their own opinions, mm -hmm. not afraid to present those opinions and be able to have broad enough shoulders to take that sort of criticism back from <laughs> people that may be involved in film. I had it myself with um, a documentary that was um, called L Street 1976, which was a documentary based on the um, sort of um, background artists um, that were involved in the first Star Wars film. It was a documentary that was very sought after. It was very hard to get come by. Couldn't get it anywhere. Couldn't get it on Netflix or street, uh, any sort of streaming platform at the time. I managed to get a hold of this film. I watched it. I didn't really like it. I wrote the review of it and the director wasn't pleased with me um, on social media. I said, well, it's only my opinion. I'm not saying I'm right. I think I'm right, but everyone think who's got an opinion think their opinion's right. I says, but it is what it is. It's it's subjective. And that's that's something you do learn and you have to remind yourself when you're doing film reviews is just be honest with yourself. You're not out to please people. You can't go on to your platform and say every film is great. You know, if you don't like something, you don't like it. If you love it, then show your love for it. Just being honest, really. And I would add to that that obviously in a traditional sense, certainly over here, obviously the BBC, big organisations like that who have traditionally written about movies, it's very different to the modern day when we do have perhaps maybe some chances as we like to see over here, but not just chances, but people from alternative media, YouTube and little blogs on the, the web, distinctly different beasts. The, the traditionalists like maybe a Mark Kermode, I don't know if you've heard of Mark Kermode, um, he's a really famous film critic over here of BBC fame. The one thing that connects them all, even though they are distinctly different, it's different media. The one thing I think that connects through it all is a passion for film and just that analytical why when you're watching it, being able to pick yeah. out technical things, flourishes that, that maybe the director's doing, things that the cinematographer's doing, things like that. And as you did allude to, you know Gianni, and having been reading Gianni's reviews that he's been posting up in the blog, he's certainly on another level again to what we were doing in those early days writing reviews. His, this guy can really take a step back look at the movie in all its different sort of compartments, if that's the correct word, nuts and bolts, and just an analyse it to the, the, the tenth degree. And you've seen that with the likes of Chris Stockman on YouTube as well, a yeah. non-traditionalist, a new sort of wave of film reviewer critique. The, the, the analysing the small little details this guy can pick out, that for me is what makes a film critique. And obviously it's, it's going to evolve as time's going on. Everything's evolving from analogue to digital and the traditionalists, the, the likes of, I don't know, perhaps a, an empire. And I'm trying to think, Roger Eb Eggert, I think it is, the other famous film critique. They will have to move with the times. And likewise, these new wave people maybe can learn off of the old school people as well. I'm mm. ranting off a little bit here. I'm going off on a sort of no. tangent. But the, the, the one commonality with film critiquing is just that love of film. Being able to take a step back from it, as Stephen did say, even if you are passionate, if it's Star Wars, for instance, and just critique some of the nasty elements in the movie. That's, I think that's the, the, the main thing. Now, I have a question, particularly, I, I do always sort of like to ask questions for uh, performers and actors, uh, since I am one myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, film critics or, you know, uh, film critiques in, in general can have a very lasting impact uh, for the better and for the worse. Um, on a lot of actors, it could actually, in fact, make or break some careers, maybe maybe less so often now than before. Um, and that's why I specifically asked, you know, who is, I guess, you know, 
qualified or deserves to, to put out critiques that will eventually, um, you know, not only affect the, mm. the whole uh, production, but specific individuals. As it's a difficult question to answer, who has the right to critique? What gives them that right? Is it a, a journalism degree? Is it a, maybe going to film school and knowing everything? Again, I, I keep going back to Mark Kermode, but this guy is an encyclopedia when it comes to movies, and you can really feel it in the man's language with movies and just the, the way that he interviews directors and people involved in the industry, actors, the likes of Sean Connery, famously, I think, that um, interviewed him. You can sense that this guy is a real lover of film, of the art, of everything in the performance. These guys probably more than us yeah. deserve to critique but, movies, I would but, imagine. But I also think that any performing artist, actor or, or director, um, when, they're, when they get into that profession, are aware of it anyway. They're aware that they're not going to be able to please everyone, whether that be an independent filmmaker or, or someone who's just made the latest Star Wars film. I think they get into it anyway, or they have to get into it with that sort of in mind that they're not, they're, they're not going to please everyone, every you know walk walk of life. They're, they're going to have to take the sort of highs with the lows anyway. Um, but I found, um, I, I spoke to the, the director of that film after my review and um, had a good chat about it, uh, private messaging. Uh, just said, listen, it's, it's just an opinion at the end of the day. Um, it, I'm not saying your film's bad. I actually, um, I felt it was very constructive. I think that's an important thing as well when you're, um, you're going into being a critique. We're, we're not very comfortable with that word, though, aren't we, John? We, no. we call ourselves gonks. We're, we're <laughs> film gonks. Um, Basically, yeah. But I think... What, um, what, I'm just I, a, can I ask what, what gonks? I, I don't think I'm familiar with... Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of Scottish glass region term for an idiot. Yeah. In a sense. Well, no, obviously not idiots, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not hugely comfortable with being called a critique because as you did say, it all goes back to that question. Who has the right to critique movies. I, I feel like I'm unworthy of sharing the same sort of space as a, a Mark Kermod or a, maybe an <laughs> Ali Plums from uh, Radio 1 who has went to school and studied it all. I feel like these yeah. people deserve their place. They have invested so much more time. We are just a pair yeah. of sure. randoms, as we like to say on the internet, sharing my views. I think we have the right to because we are fan films, a films of fan, and that is the most important thing. If you have a passion for it and you, you want to give a voice out there, then... If someone wants to listen to it, then they're, they're entitled to it. Likewise, yeah. if they don't, then they won't. But Stephen, you're absolutely right. I, I don't want to take over here. I no, know no. you are the, also the host of this podcast, but I always found actors to be very strange beasts. If you like, the, the, mm. and you being an actor, you will probably, I don't know if you will connect with this, but they seem to be quite complicated. They, they want to have the limelight. They want to have all of the attention and the sort of adulation, but at the same time, they can be quite, how shall I put it, multi-layered. They have the sensitivities there I don't know you, you look at maybe a Robin Williams and he's probably a shining example of you can have that, that darkness that you, you want to have the attention you want to have the adulation but there's a darkness within it that sometimes fuels it and it is it's dangerous when you're critiquing um, individuals you may get lost in the fact that this this isn't this human this is just a character they are portraying on right. the screen right. and sometimes it does cross the the mark, the line, if you'd like you've seen it with Kelly Marie Tran and stuff like that through Star Wars the abuse she got on social media for a character that she had no say in, she didn't write. So it can you can cross that line yeah. and get personal and it can it can it can probably damage people's careers irrevocably. So it's it's a tough one. But yeah I, I, I keep coming back to it. Passion. If you have the passion and you now have that space on the internet to lend your voice, then I think you should have it right. But whether people listen to you is another it's, thing. It's certainly a, a, tr a tricky question. Um but I, I think that was a pretty well rounded answer. Uh, I am very curious, uh, especially since you guys saw a, a film a day. Do you feel <laughs> writing uh, right after you see a film or do you do additional research just to see maybe, you know, um, what happened behind the scenes? What kind of choices the, the director made or is it simply based off the hour and a half, the two hours that you see on screen? Also, it depends on the movie. If it's maybe a filmmaker you're aware of in the past, like a known or something, and you understand how this guy operates and what he's been trying to do in previous movies, then you may you maybe want to research. And I've certainly seen it even as recently uh, when we've been doing video reviews, uh, the likes of Jojo Rabbit, Taika Waititi. I found before we'd done the review, again, often watching and studying some of the videos, he's, he, he did videos with Stephen Merchant about 
that scene where they, they, they go into the house, the Gestapo, and they question Jojo and his sister in the movie. And I find I find that very interesting and illuminating when you actually look into what was going through the director's mind, that the process of constructing this scene and stuff, that can be very interesting. But likewise, in the early days, we, we tried so hard, didn't we, Stephen, to not get influenced by other reviewers. No, that, that, that we, we were trying to find yeah. our sort of reviewing technique, or, or writing style. And yeah. I felt um, I, I would have to lock myself away after watching a film that I was reviewing because mm -hmm. I felt if I started watching other people's sort of views on it, it was possibly... Skewing? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah skewing my, my sort of interpretation of the film a little bit. I was starting to see it from their perspective and I felt... It's not very honest of me doing that. I did, and reading reviews on IMDb, etc. And I felt I, I, I can't do that, you know, because I, I'll end up not copying what they're saying, but their opinions might influence my experience of watching that film initially. I felt writing them right away, you know, after watching the film was probably the best sort of method for myself. I can only speak for myself. Do you think that watching the let's stick with with movies now since yeah. you know we, we don't see TV and uh, in in the theater um, mm -hmm. does it change your perspective? Do do you find when you write reviews or do you think you can be pretty objective about that or or do you feel that there's a different sense of when you see a movie on screen and let's say you're you're focused you know every second um, as opposed to watching it at home maybe you pause mm -hmm. it take a couple of notes it sort of takes you out of it absolutely um, it does yeah when you're watching it in the the theater. It's almost like a, I don't know, a, a momentous experience, yeah. especially if you're watching it. Like recently, uh, the last movie we actually got to see in a theatre was Tenet with Chris Nolan. It was in, I think, August it came out here. Mm. There was a dip in pandemic sort of regulations. We were allowed to go to the theatre and just sitting and watching it and basking in it. I've seen the movie twice in four days. There was yeah. that in love with it. I know it's um, it's got a sort of marmite effect. Some people seem to hate this movie. The sound mixing was of taking them out of the movie, but... There's something about that process of watching it in a theatre that is completely different to sitting in a house. It seems to be more memorable too. Um, I, I can think back to movies I've watched in a theatre and I can remember vividly what I was doing, what was happening on the screen. Whilst when you're in, or whereas I should say, when you're in the, the house watching it perhaps on an iPad or on your, your TV or whatever you're watching it on, you do, you have distractions and yeah. it takes you out and it becomes less memorable. I don't know. That's why I feel yeah. like I have to have my notes. I think when I'm watching yeah, it in the John, house, it's strange. I, I agree because I think when you go to the theatre, you are going, you're going into that theatre with an analytical eye to begin with. Um, that experience has been removed for the time being. And I feel that when you're, you know, you're sitting in the house watching a film on television, there is, it's, it's very easy to get distracted. And the whole flow and the process is altered in that sense of the way that you would normally prepare yourself, you know, embrace this film, um, you know, channel it into your own sort of head and you collect your thoughts while you're watching it. That's missing from the, the, the theater experience, I feel, because yeah. like most people that enjoy going to the cinema, you know, one of the, the best things is, is just locking yourself away from the, the yeah. real world mm -hmm. and, and just, uh, you know, just taking in this uh, two hour, three hour movie and just, really embracing it just getting every sort of little detail you can out yeah. of the experience and that's lost sadly at the moment well i just i think this is a, a pretty good you know transition into the future of of cinema it's more specifically uh, movie theaters uh as we know it, it it has been declining i i in the united states um but internationally uh it has if not and steady has been increasing in terms of uh, movie attendance. A couple of years back, as we all know, there was a phenomenon called movie pass. I'm not sure if it was a, a big oh, thing in Scotland, but you know, when when myself when I was in college, uh, it gave a chance, especially for the younger generations, to really experience the theater because um, it was never really a, a popular economical choice to to spend, especially in New York City, to spend fifteen twenty dollars to see a film. When you can easily, you know, see it online, and you know, being college kids, probably pirated somewhere online, and you know, this and that. So it was really a time um, that you know you got to go to the movie base virtually for 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 free for where you were paying for that kind of a pass. And I felt a lot of my classmates, and, and I'm, I'm happy that I had the experience because we were all seeing movies constantly um, when we had the advantage. 
and now it, it's you know now we're seeing uh, streaming uh, platforms uh, trying to chime in to how the Academy Awards are working, mm -hmm. um, and movies are you know being made differently. They're not being made for the for the big screen. So, what is your take? I, I guess we don't have to uh, you know focus in on the United States, um, but the future of, of cinema, and and what it's going to look like uh, after the pandemic. Uh, well, just taking up on the movie pass thing, we do have similar things over here. We have a, an unlimited pass at Cineworld. Um, I don't know how that would factor in over in the States in terms of companies, whether it's AMC or Regal. I, I know there's a parent company, but Cineworld do. It's, I think it's £18 a month, and you can go unlimited and watch yeah. as many movies in, in, in any given day as you want. You pay £18 and you, you get to see a movie every day? 18 pounds, you can go as many times you can watch three you want. movies a oh, day wow. if you want. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. It really does open so it up. That's the even better than, than movie pass because is, yeah. movie pass, you're only able to see one movie a day for, for but, I think, ten dollars, which I don't know how what that translates into, but it's probably something very similar. Probably yeah. about seven pounds or something over here, round about that much. But as it it's great. Uh, we were aware of movie pass because uh, having watched the likes of John Campaign and stuff like that, we were felt in and these sort of rise and fall of this company. I think it was unlimited at one point and then it, it rose and then it collapsed a bit. I think the theatres were starting to cannibalise in on the profits. Over here it is, it's very much theatre, sort of runner, uh, cinema run if you like. We've got Odin do one as well, I think. If you, over here, the other theatre chain is very cheap anyway. It's mm. only about £5 a ticket, so it's really accessible for people. I just think that film's easier to consume over here. It really is compared to the States. But I don't want to go off on a chan tangent about that. In terms of the future of film, but it really is going to be interesting. Yeah. You see where it goes after the pandemic, because obviously there's going to be theatre companies ran right into the ground. We know AMC over in the States is something like three, four billion or a trillion. I don't know what it is. The last I looked, I think it was a billion, three billion in debt. So some of these companies may not make it to the other side of the pandemic. And it will be interesting. You mentioned um, about obviously Amazon looking to maybe seize in on theatre chains perhaps come in and take over these companies and we see this continual I don't know, transformation towards the streaming giants taking over the film industry or it could go the other way we could see it maybe going to more independent film yeah. theatres rising again we have a great independent theatre in our city the Glasgow Film Theatre and it gives you a wide variety of different sort of independent and just different movies and they, they yeah. get the directors in and you can have q and I personally would love to see the rise of independent theatres again because you're going to get more variety in content as well. Right now it's very much skewed towards big blockbusters, Marvel, Star Wars, all these huge blockbuster releases and sometimes the smaller, more independent centred movies. They just get lost, they, they sweep under the radar. So yeah. it's going to be interesting. I don't know what the future holds, but um, film will well, survive. Well, that. I, I want to dig a little deeper into this. I actually spoke with a little bit about this with, with John, but I'm sure you guys have a much more uh, unique take on this in terms of the streaming platforms. Uh, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, you know, they want to get their foot in the door. Uh, they want their movies to be up for the Academy Awards. It doesn't seem that they're very interested in releasing their films in, in the theater, as we saw. You know, when their, their first films, they, you know, whatever the limit was, if they had to show it once, I think a premiere in, in one in LA and one in New York City. I mean, you really barely saw them in the theaters. Yeah. And they're constantly negotiating with the sign after union. And it looks like, like they're winning the negotiations. It, it seems that uh, they sort of have the academy in a corner. Um, and the academy has to meet their demands because uh, they, you know, unofficially sort of threaten that they can start their own Academy Awards with the amount of production value that, that they can put into uh, all of this. So do you think, I mean, is it really a threat to how films are, are made? Because, you know, before they were made for the big screens with specific dimensions. Now, and correct me if I'm wrong, they may just be, you know, making it for how big your television screen is at home or even, uh, you know, worse for your iPhone or iPad, whatever the, yeah. you know, uh, statistics show. I can't fathom that, watching a movie on an iPad or, or a phone. It just <laughs> it doesn't transmute to me. The, the, the smallest screen I would go to is maybe a 30 inch. I just can't imagine consuming maybe a Martin Scorsese movie on an iPad. I know when The Irishman came out, he was 
urging people not to watch it on their phone and it blew my mind. I know you, Stephen, were forced. You were yeah. flying home from yeah. a holiday yeah. and you had to watch it on an iPad. But maybe, Stephen, I don't know if you maybe want to come in, how you, you I, feel Irishman about Irishman is, is, is a, sorry to cut, but that's a great example. It, I, yeah. it did not show in theaters at all. It showed yeah. maybe once or twice. I couldn't even get a chance to see it. It wasn't yeah. there. So, so there is some kind of strategy behind it not going to the theaters and i'm not sure what that's going to look like in the long run and the I, irishman yeah. is a good example because that's a solid movie i mean that's a yes. classic I, Lawrence Scorsese I, I think, movie. yeah i think martin scorsese might have had some kind of influence and in, and in one of his conditions to take that film to a streaming platform was to have at least one premiere we had one over here didn't we it was one premiere one day yeah it was in glasgow film theater yeah funnily enough yeah. um yeah it was really short and uh, there wasn't a great theatrical window at all and I don't, I'm not for that. I'm not for these movies moving more and more towards straight to streaming. We've seen it with HBO Max. I hate this dual release. I've spoke about it so many times on the show. I think it's a terrible idea. We've seen Nolan come out. We've seen, I think, um, James Gunn came out. Um, who, was, who was the other guy? Um, Denis Villeneuve, I think, done an open letter on Variety. All yeah, against this, I think this dual release. It's lover, terrible. You, you oh. do see that sort of um, way of doing it very pointless you know especially if you're if you've got access to the theater i know obviously just now depends where you are in the world uh for the restrictions etc mm -hmm. but um for ourselves um it doesn't really appeal to us doesn't it not john you know having it sort of dual release no it's been because as we did say we have great unlimited sort yeah. of things i don't know if that's going to continue though after the pandemic that's the other thing will these theater companies be able to keep delivering this sort of unlimited card will it be not financially viable, but it doesn't it doesn't appeal to me because first of all, we don't have HBO Max over here in the United no. Kingdom. So it's not even something we could have. But even if it was available, I hate the idea of them cutting off the, the or maybe cutting the feet from under, if, if that's even the right phrase. I'm terrible with phrases, cutting the legs out from under maybe the feet of companies because that's always been um, a big part of enjoying film for me. I've said it on shows before with Stephen. That's something about just within human, this the sort of human condition. We've always loved to go and watch performances. It's very different watching with, you know, in, in a live theater with everyone mm -hmm. and then watching alone, you know, you might find something more funny if you have, you know, people laughing behind you, you sort yeah. of get it. Uh, you know, little things like that that really enhance the experience. Yeah, I was about to say one of the most interesting sort of theatrical experiences I ever had was watching A Quiet Place because it was a complete sort of, antithesis to what you've just said is laughing it was so quiet mm. it was just unbelievably quiet and I, I don't think that experience and it, it obviously lent so much to the movie being in that sort of theater so quiet you were almost part of that movie I think that would have lost something uh, hugely if you were watching that on a tv and I think a lot of what Krasinski was doing in that movie was tailor-made for that theatrical setting watching this movie you almost scared to take off because you feel like you're part of this world and you'll bring these aliens out <laughs> That's that's just what movies are about for me. It's about watching the movie on the biggest screen. Since I was four, I was four years old when I went to my first movie and seen my first movie in a theatre. It was a uh, Jurassic Park, uh, a Steven Spielberg movie. And since that point onwards, I've just been also obsessed an, an, with an avid critic of, of what we were just talking about. Yeah, is that, yeah, Spielberg's <laughs> an avid critic. Yeah, well, I can understand. Um, the, the other argument for streaming services, we've certainly tried to make that argument on yeah. our shows. Um, yeah. What Netflix is good at, they're not all bad. They, they do lend an opportunity for up and coming creators and maybe creators who are on the decline to, to have an, a chance to make their, their movies. Nick Cage is probably the best example. He's making all yeah. these wacky movies that wouldn't, would not be greenlit by a traditional movie studio. Yeah. And then obviously up and coming directors get the chance to maybe make a movie for this streaming service. Whether it gets watched is another thing though, because Obviously, there's so much content on there. I can't recall the director. I can't recall the movie. It does my nothing. I forget it all the time. But it's um, an Asian-American um, director made a great movie a couple of years ago. She was on the Actors' Round Table or Directors' Round Table, and she actually knocked back Netflix. They, they offered to make the movie, and she knocked it back and went to A24 instead. But I think that that, that is, in a sense, what I'm trying to get at. They, they do offer the opportunity for maybe smaller filmmakers and smaller actors to get their, their foot in the door yeah I totally agree sorry yeah, I, went off right there. I, I i i do think as a counter argument it is important to note that um 
currently that I think there is more of a, an array of opportunity for younger filmmakers, uh, independent filmmakers to sort of get their foot in the door. Uh, none, nonetheless, I think this will still be a debate going on as to, um, you know, to the very top for the uh, Academy Awards, what's considered, you know, or, or worthy to be nominated and whatnot. Um, and with that said, uh, I sort of want to go on a, maybe a bit of a lighter topic which is the the Golden Globe nominations that were announced. I wanted to just get your take and then we'll move on to the to the Oscars. Absolutely. Uh, we actually done a show, we broke it down. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, but first and foremost, it's going to be very hard, obviously, for us to speak about most of the... We, we even says that in our breakdown on the show. Lots of these movies haven't yet released over here in the United Kingdom, so it was really interesting. I'd only really seen the trial of the Chicago 7, um, I, I literally just watched Ma Rainey's Black Bottom the other day. So there's a lot of the movies which are up, the likes of The Father and stuff like that, that haven't yet released over here. But I found it very interesting. Those, those, the, I think those two were on, on Netflix. Yeah, or yeah, they, they were. Yeah, they were. Literally, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I literally watched Ma Rainey's Black Bottom the other day. I thought it was incredible. Um, and, and I love the fact that Chadwick Boseman's getting love showered on him now. Um, obviously, yeah. sadly, the tragic uh, thing that happened to him a couple of months ago. I love the fact that this guy's getting some posthumous love because he deserves it. He's an incredible yeah. actor. But the, the one thing that really stood out to me from this, and even the, I think it's the SAG, the Screen Actors Guild Awards, is the snubbing of Delroy Lindo. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If you've seen The Five Bloods, again, a Netflix movie. <laughs> um, what your thoughts were on his performance? I thought he was one of the best leading actor performances of last year. And he's been snubbed in both of those big awards. So there were some interesting things sort of popped out. And this uh, Minari, I think it is, is the other one. Uh, I think it's been put in the foreign language category and that's creating a lot of controversy. Apparently that's amazing. But yes, I don't know if you've got anything uh, to add for the Golden Globes. Um, uh, the funny thing was we, we actually um, we were talking about it on Tuesday show, weren't we, John? Mm -hmm. um, they just dropped uh, on Tuesday afternoon uh, on, on social media and I wasn't even aware of the nominations coming out. I don't know about yourself. And I think Not that's... You told I me, think the, the sort of knock-on effect from this pandemic has really... Um, stifled a lot of enthusiasm for the awards season as well. I, I don't think the buzz is there as it once was. I think it's just because of the sort of lack of um, film that's coming out here in the UK at the moment. Uh, News of the World, the Tom Hanks film, is mm -hmm. not coming out here till next week. I think it's been out everywhere else for over a month now. Uh, we, we didn't get to see Parasite, and I think we were the last country Six on months. the planet to yeah. see Parasite in the theatres, wow. us in Ireland. Um, so we, we do tend to have to wait quite a long time to see these award caliber movies like sort of Jojo Rabbit in 1917, which was a, a World War One movie <laughs> predominantly set around British forces. We had to wait yeah. to January. I think it was two months after the States. So it's usually really hard for us to comment on these oh, movies. Even that are 1917, that was basically your film. <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, it was it, parts of it were filmed in our city in Glasgow down at the shipyards. So I, I love that movie. I thought that was incredible. Yeah. So as it's really hard for us sometimes to speak, even in a normal year, uh, when theater, movies are coming out in theaters about these award sort of buzzworthy movies. But this year it's been really, really difficult with Father. I don't think that's coming out till next month over here. And, and lots of these movies which have been nominated that are not Netflix movies are not even out over here. And literally you're not even getting early reactions. And I think, Stephen, what you touched upon as well about maybe the buzz not being there, I think you can maybe see that in even the animated category mm. this year. It's terrible. The animated movies are, are horrendous. You've got uh, The Croods, I think, yeah, and two movie, yeah. under par Pixar movies. Traditionally, you have amazing stop motion animated movies in there or some really cool sort of vibrant animated movies. But it's, it's dead in the water this year for me. And yeah. I, I don't think, I don't want to say it's all dead in the water and it's, it's terrible. There's also been some really good movies that have come out in the last calendar year. I mean, there's, I'm trying to think what the one is. I think it's Leslie Odom Jr. Um, one Night in Miami, is it? I don't know if that's a correct movie. There's ones that I'm really excited to see. Touch a little bit in terms of the, the Oscar categories we were talking about. Maybe not so much this year, but um, I feel that international films made uh, a very, very strong presence in the past couple of years with films like you mentioned, Parasite, with mm -hmm. films like Roma, mm -hmm. which now are sort of breaking barriers because they're coming out of that international category. And, you know, last year, it's sort of, uh, there was this thing, you know, uh, the Polish film Cold War, which, you know, I was rooting for, 
you know, it was going up against Roma, which was also nominated for, for Best Picture, and it was also in some other categories. So do you think that international films are going to be treated differently? Or do you think that the, the Hollywood establishment, um, you know, with predominantly American produced films is going to stay how, how it's always been? What, what I hope not. I hope not. Um, I, I really do hope the, the foreign language films start to rise into prominence. Um, we, Stephen, went down a rabbit hole with uh, Boon jong Hu. I always forget the guys, I always mix the name up. I hope I'm saying it right. It's Boon jong Hu or Bong joon Hu. I always mix the two na- the name up. Yeah. But we went down a rabbit hole with this guy's films and he's just sublime. I've not seen a filmmaker like him in my life. Uh, Parasite is by far one of the best films I've seen in the last 15, 20 years. Just unbelievable. The experience, the cinematography, the journey you go on, the clinical sort of way that they make their movies. I love Korean movies. So I sincerely hope he and like-minded filmmakers over in Korea start to rise to prominence. Um, Roma, I really enjoyed Roma. Again, that was a Netflix movie. I don't know how the hell they managed to keep uh, to keep on sort of attracting these caliber of filmmakers, the Coen brothers, Alfonso Cuaron, was it done? Um, Roma, I think it was. Um, I- I'd love to see the rise of film, uh, foreign language films. Um, it's something I've always, I says this time and again to Steve, you know, on shows and just in general, I, I don't usually keep my finger uh, on the, the, the pulse of foreign language movies popping up. I usually wait until the, the award ceremonies and we get buzz on different kind of uh, foreign language movies. And then I go and watch them afterwards. But I've so, certainly uh, watched a yeah. lot of foreign language I, movies. I think over the as years. well with the success of Parasite, there will be more focus. You know, I think yeah. it didn't, just because it, it didn't just win, obviously, the foreign category, it won five. Four, four or five, was yeah. it? Um, I think, the I think there'll be more doesn't. focus on it as well. I think even more so just now. Um, once we see the nominations come up for the Academy Awards as well. But I think there's going to be more focus on it now. It's funny because um, I always felt that, you know, it was probably treated as a so, sort of second-class category mm-hmm. in the past, you know. But I think when you see talented filmmakers, it doesn't matter where they're from. Um, we, we noticed that with the Korean films. Mm-hmm. We noticed uh, just putting our analytical eye on them. Um the sort of messages that was in those films, Snowpiercer being one of them. Satire, um, yeah. the, the class systems and stuff like that, yeah. you know, that um, that director, um, you know, put into the film as as um, the sort of background message. Yeah, it was great social analysis. Yeah, I think it movies. is, John. You know, I yeah. think um, with the success of Parasite, um, I think there is going to be more focus on it now because I think it was a serious film. We saw the trailer. We were recommended the trailer. We watched it, blown away by the trailer itself. Yeah. The shift in tone halfway through a trailer, a two-minute trailer, was something we'd never experienced Indeed, before. They didn't give anything away in that trailer. No, exactly. That, that's incredible. We, we, we talk about trailers, and we we really enjoy trailers that don't give the story away, but give you enough information to, you know, yeah, intrigue yeah. you. And usually that bounces miles off. And I think that um, Korean films like that, we're going down a rabbit hole with Indian film just now as mm-hmm. well. Um, very much a journey we've been going on for the last six months with Indian cinema. Yeah, learning the sort of different um, regions. regions yeah. You know, um, oh, we've been told. Yeah, we've, <laughs> yeah. You know, inadvertently Hollywood, Hollywood. offended. You know, um, just through our own ignorance. But it's one thing we've always prided ourselves on uh, here at Movie Burners was um, we don't just go down mainstream. We we enjoy independent films. We enjoy foreign films. Um, and we begin with an open an open mind. So that's the way we do treat the Academy Awards. We do treat the Golden Globes as well uh, with an open mind. You know, and I think I mean, more people are like that. I mean, I think of the great foreign language movies I've watched in recent years, and not even ones that have been Oscar buzz. What no. they, the likes of uh, Less Innocence. I don't know if that did get an Oscar nomination, actually. That was incredible. Um, Downfall as well. The Haltman was yeah. a great um, German movie. It went off in a sort of fantastical setting, but it was based on a real story. The Land of Mine was a great Danish foreign language movie, as you did say, we've been going down this Indian sort yeah. of voyage watching lots of Indian movies. So we are real fans of foreign language movies when they are yeah. done well. And it's just, it takes you off on a different sort of experience and journey. You get to see filmmaking from that sort of region's yeah. point of view. There's different styles. There's different, I keep yeah. saying, the, the clinicism. The I mean, even, cl- even Bollywood nature. is is its own monster. It's it's technically bigger than Hollywood with more films. Incredible, the scale of Indian, all the industries, um, Sandalwood and Tollywood and stuff like that. I, I, I didn't know they existed. No. It's like another world 
and the, yeah. the, the, the different styles within that actual subcontinent is unbelievable. So I'm certainly all for the rise of foreign language movies. I hope they can almost, I don't know, at least a, a match the, the best picture category, but I think that's maybe been a little bit too fan, fant- fantastical, if I can say the right word. Well, it's also going to bring the question, you know, um, how many, you know, is, is this going to continue to be uh, an American uh, Academy uh, Academy Awards, or is it going to really be truly international? I, I guess we'll see uh, in the coming years. Gentlemen, uh, we have uh, not a lot of time left, uh, to say the least. So I just wanted to ask you, um, going back to uh, Movie Burner, um, where do you see it going? Um, or are, are you looking for writers? Um, wh- what do you I- ideally want it to be? Because I, I think uh, for you know, for our listeners uh, who are here with us, probably want to know, you know, what you guys uh, have set for the near future. I'll let you go, Steve. Yeah, but- I mean, without sounding too hippy dippy, um, it's something that I don't think we've really sort of placed a finger on where we see ourselves in five years. Mm-hmm. The most important thing for myself, and I can't speak for John, but I think he'll probably um, share my sentiments, is that as long as we have the passion for film and we enjoy what we're doing. Um, yeah. We don't really see, see ourselves um, having some kind of massive studio in five years, and you know, having fifty writers, you know, working under us I or wish anything we like that. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really just—it's always been progressive, and it's always been little baby steps for ourselves. We found our own development, our personal development, over the last four years. When we look back at ourselves from two thousand and seventeen to now, we see how far we've came um, in the learning process of how to analyze a film, how to write it, how to talk about it, how to present ourselves. Um, and that's, I don't think that's going to change. I don't think that's going to change for myself anyway. No. Um, I enjoy talking about film with anyone, um, especially you talked about it earlier, Bartek, about the dynamics is maybe gone just now through Zoom calls. There's nothing better than sitting around with a group of friends and talking about a film after you come out of the cinema. And Something that's we what we kind do, of try to inject into the shows. We try to get that sort of um, that sort of uh, um, vibe into the shows. Like we've just fresh out the cinema and we want to talk about what we've just experienced. And as long as we keep doing that uh, and we keep heading in the right direction, I'll be happy with that. But I've not really got any sort of massive plans at the moment, as long as we're moving forward and not back away. Yeah, Stephen, I can only echo what you say. It's just about keeping that enjoyment up. Uh, the passion. I'll always have passion for film. I've had it since I was a young kid. Yeah. Watching crazy stop motion movies in the 90s and stuff like that. Just maintaining that passion, that love, and keeping it fun and interesting. And when it starts becoming a chore and boring, then that's when you lose that edge. And I, I love talking. I, we, we do shows five days a week. We also have the writer side of things. I, I just love to see us developing out and hopefully becoming, I don't know, maybe a light version of something that's already existing. We have that enjoyability aspect, but we don't lose focus on what the, what we've been doing prior to that. And I think as well, John, any time that um, we do advertise for writers, and we're always looking for writers, just to answer your other question, Bartek, I think... I need to start writing again, um, incidentally. It's been we, too long. <laughs> the, the thing they will always ask is, is, what style do you want us if we got a word count? Um, how far can I go, etc.? cetera? We, we kind of just sort of, take our own sort of um, ethos uh, and put it onto them by saying, just write what you feel, you know. Um, we've not got any restrictions here, as long as it's not causing too much offence or anything like that. Just be honest in your writing, you know, and, and we welcome that. You know? uh, and gentlemen, just one last question. It's, uh, it's become a bit of a tradition for the show. Uh, very simple question, uh, your favourite film uh, of all time for each of you. I'll go first because I know it right away. It's Back to the Future for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, go Cool Hand Luke. The, I was, the, uh, the first one? The first one. I was t- 10 years old when I saw it, Bartek. Um, and although I'm a massive Star Wars fan and I always have a special place in my heart for episode four, A New Hope, as it's called now, I always knew it's Star Wars. Um, Back to the Future for me just has everything in it. It's, it has sci-fi, it has romance, it has the comedy, it has the drama, special effects. Um, it just has everything, you know, in the chemistry between all the actors, especially Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd for me. You've got Crispin yeah. Glover, who's totally out there um, as an actor, uh, a fantastic actor playing George McFly. Um, 
just everything about it. I'm intrigued by obviously time travel. Um, one of the first films I ever saw was uh, the H.G. Wells mm-hmm. The Time Machine, uh, the George Powell movie, um, starring Rod Taylor. And since then, I had this fascination with that sort of um, genre. Back to the Future for me, I just I came out at a time when I was just very young. Uh, Marty McFly was sort of the guy that I wanted to be, a very cool guy on the skateboard. Love the soundtrack as well, Alan's Westry soundtrack. Just everything about it. For me, it's just cool hand look. Um, I love Paul Newman. I love his sparkling blue eyes, the charisma that guy held. Just an amazing movie for me. Just that study of a really troubled guy. A guy that seemed to have it all. He had happiness. He was the cool guy. And just that, that human condition, again, studying it, how this guy was a deeply troubled and complex person underneath that sort of glean of happiness and positivity. And just that that line at the end. Um, you, you, you said Paul, Paul Newman? Paul Newman, yeah. In in which film? Cool Hand Look. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Cool Hand Look. It's saying, uh, what is it we have? A fail- what we have here is a failure to communicate. That line at the end. It's just, for me, I've watched it so many times, but look at the, it's always really hard to pick a, a favorite movie. I could go through the list of maybe two dozen movies and how, they could all you, hold that sort of special place in my heart. How do you manage it? It's completely uh, opinionated on my end, and I probably shouldn't be ch- chiming in again, but. How do you manage to accept the ending of that movie? Do you, oh, do you, do you wish just, it would have ended differently or, or do you? I thought it was perfect. I just thought it, because this guy was so troubled and it, with also the loss of his mother, that was a sort of tipping point. He had nothing else to really live for. He was always going to be a guy who was in and out of jail, incarceration after incarceration. He was just a troubled soul who had it all, but he just didn't have that perhaps that final sort of polished part of his personality that could allow him to live a wholesome life away from jail and trouble. He always had that maverick, dirty sort of part of his personality. I don't know if dirty is the right word, but I just felt that was the perfect ending for me. Well, uh, I, I enjoyed both those movies. I actually, I didn't expect those answers from either of you, but um, <laughs> very, very, uh, very interesting insights. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for, for providing um you know, all you did uh, in our podcast. We, we hope to have you back again, maybe sometime after the Oscars or whatever else is going to happen in the industry. Who knows? Um, thank you so much. Uh, and is, uh, is there, uh, apart from the website, is there any handles that you want to uh, let people know about? Instagram, YouTube? Yeah, we're on YouTube at um, Movie Burner Entertainment. And we do, we sort of toy with Twitch. We kind of multi-stream on there, but also Twitch is more predominantly a gaming channel and it's really hard to get a sort of standing on there we're on twitter at movie burners and on instagram at movie burner entertainment as well so they're very very active as well platforms yeah, try to be. thanks to kevin i'll let you deal with that well kevin's our, our fellow movie burner he's my brother he was the other founding member and he does a lot of the, the background work with the the website for the blog side of it um, keeping that fresh and obviously the social media platforms as well. Stephen, John, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy you. your Pleasure. evening. Uh, I know it's, it's beyond evening uh, over there in Scotland, but uh, enjoy your night. Well. <laughs> uh, and uh, we hope to speak to you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.